Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear guests, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the American Chamber of Commerce in the Slovak Republic to this very special second edition of Women in Business Conference. My name is Barbara and I will take you through today's virtual hybrid conference. At the beginning of the year, we found ourselves in a very difficult and unprecedented situation that was caused by the pandemic of coronavirus. A lot of people got sick, a lot of countries had to close their borders and encouraged people to stay at home in their home quarantines. The closure of companies, factories and schools, universities and other institutions will have and has negative impact on our economy, but we have to find ways how to reinvent the way we live and work. I am very happy to welcome you here because together with our esteemed panelists and guests, we will talk about some of the challenges and opportunities arising during this situation. And we will also talk about managerial strategies that should be taken on board in order to create sustainable, resilient and good working environment and societies. We will also address questions concerning women and women empowerment and their support. We have truly a fruitful afternoon ahead of us and it is my great pleasure to welcome among us Ronald Blaško, the Executive Director of the American Chamber of Commerce in the Slovak Republic. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, honorable guests, members of the European Parliament, Deputy Chief of Mission, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all here today in this seemingly unusual place, in front of your screens as well, of course. Once again, very warm welcome to everyone. I would like to reflect a bit on why we are organizing this event and why here. As some of you may recall, we have planned to hold this event after the last year, a very successful conference on the International Women's Day in Binario. However, as subsequent events showed, our decision to call off the conference on the 8th of March, already before it was officially banned to hold public events, proved to be right. Originally, we intended to talk about prosperous society, about the role of women in companies and what we all can do to improve their potential, their uh, position, and what we can do to make sure they have fair and equal treatment and remuneration. These are still important topics, but now we have a new normal. This is why we are here at our first hybrid live and online conference at our new venue and going to talk about women who are in the firing line in this recession. Globally, according to a global consultancy, women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to this crisis than men's jobs. Let me explain a little bit. We have grown used to seeing men in blue collar jobs bear the brunt of recession retrenchments. This time is different. Women, held, women hold a lot of jobs being eggs in sectors such as retail and accommodation. In the US, there is already a talk of the she session. In Australia, people speak of the pink recession. Another new thing, schools and childcare centers closed. Mothers have taken up the slack. In the UK, during the lockdown, mothers of primary school age children spend on average five hours per day on homeschooling, while fathers only two. We could go on. Globally, women take up to 70% of jobs in the healthcare and social sector, putting them at risk of pandemic and infection. According to the UN, we have also a shadow pandemic in domestic violence. It goes without saying that men are suffering as well. For example, they've been more likely to die of COVID-19 than women. Nevertheless, we are still learning how to cope with this situation and how the burdens of this crisis are falling on different levels 
and differently from the past recessions. Now that I would like to conclude on a positive note by asking, does the havoc unleashed by the COVID-19 contain also some good news for women? I hope so. I am sure that the line of distinguished speakers we have managed to gather here today will share with us their opinions and they will also present plenty of encouraging and positive examples how opportunities by the presented by pandemic have been turned into improvements of women's role and position in our society. And if not, then at least they will share their opinion and ideas how we can and what needs to be done so that we do not move backwards on the progress achieved in the past years. Enjoy the debate. Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much for your inspiring words, Ronald. That was great. Thank you very much. I have a question for you guys in the audience and also a question for those of you who are watching us online. Raise your hands. Who of you is employed? Who of you is unemployed? You don't have to raise your hands here. <laughs> who of you is self-employed? Who of you is on maternity leave or parental leave? How did you cope with the situation over the last six months where we were trapped at home in our home quarantines? I have to say and admit that it was very difficult and challenging for me because I had to find my work-life balance. I had to cater for my child. I had to deal with a lot of household stuff and still be able to work from home and find a quiet place where I could focus. And I'm sure that it was very stressful for everyone, but it seems that women were hit harder. They suffered more emotionally, and also they became victims of domestic violence. We are slowly returning back to our normal lives, and even though they may not be the same as they were before Corona, we have to find ways how to address the main issues and challenges, and how to go on and create resilient societies, economies, and empower gender equality. The aim of this conference is also to get you involved and I am kindly asking you now to take out your cell phones and you at home, guys who are watching us online, take your PCs, iPads or any handheld devices and we're gonna pose a poll question. Okay, so are you now online on your platforms? How do you wear your face masks when in public transport? covering my mouth, under my chin, or on my forehead? And now it's your time to respond to a very simple question, which is also very, very acute and, and I think very relevant for these days. So I'm going to give you a little bit more time. Okay, so type any answer and click Submit you will be able to see on your screens when you are watching a chat button and a submit button on your platform. So we're gonna see the results. Okay, so 7% is saying they are covering their mouth. No, only 6%, it's jumping. But you can do better. I think we have only 32 answers. 34, okay, I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to complete this very simple task. Cool. So on your platforms, you will be also able to give us some feedback. And there are also feedback forms and an open question. So you can give us any ideas for improvements throughout the whole session. And you can also use the Slido to interact with us, to get engaged and foster the conversation. Because we will also take some questions during the Q&A session. Maybe not all of them, but we will try our best. So we're going to see the results. Okay, 40 people, 41 people. I'm going to give you a little incentive. We have also a prize for you guys. So if you get engaged and involved, we have a beautiful voucher, a gift voucher worth 100 euro from Interclinic. I think this is a good incentive, so you should get involved. Okay, so at the moment we have 42 answers. 95% is 
covering their nose and mouth, and this is a good answer because this is the way how we should wear the face masks. Okay, and covering mouth, only 5%, under my chin, 0%, and on my forehead, 0%. Okay, so we have clever people watching, and that's a good sign. Okay, okay, we're gonna wait for 20, 30 more seconds, and we are ready to start our first panel discussion. In our first panel discussion, In our first panel discussion, we will address whether men and women were affected by the global coronavirus and the pandemic to the <coughs> same extent or whether there were some differences. And I am very glad to welcome among us Lucia Duriš Nikolsonova, no. member of the European Parliament and member of the Bureau of the European Conservatives and Reformist Group. Welcome. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Natasha Franceschi, Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Bratislava. Welcome. Thank you. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Miriam Lexman, member of the European Parliament who represents the group of the European Part People's Party Christian Democrats, and she will connect with us remotely. Hi, Miriam. Welcome. Where are you at? In Brussels? Yes, in Brussels, in the European Parliament. What's the weather like in Brussels? It's very sunny. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. We have a sunny weather here as well. <laughs> yeah, great. Ladies, all of you are very successful. All of you have rich CVs showing your level of experience and expertise. Throughout your life, have you ever been in a situation where you thought that being a woman was actually an obstacle? We'll see ya. Thank you. Uh, actually, I've been in politics uh, since uh, 2010, so it's 10 years now. And through this period of time, I, I experienced many um, situations like you uh, expressed. Uh, for instance, when a man, uh, a politician, is enthusiastic about some topic, some issue that he wants to address, uh, for instance, a fight, a fight uh, against corruption, and he really gets enthusiastic, then uh, the public takes him, considers him to be a leader worth following. Mm -hmm. But when a woman, a politician, does the same, then uh, we are called hysterical. Uh, when I was fighting the vulgarity of the previous uh, speaker of the Slovak National Parliament, uh, he called me live off, on TV a small gypsy. Mm -hmm. And when I had to go to work uh, after five days uh, of giving birth to my third child, because of enormous pressure from the former leaders of the Slovak National Council, I was really targeted with tons of hate speech, mostly from women, though, mm -hmm. who called me a bad mother, who wished me to get cancer, Terrible. who wanted mm -hmm. to call the social services to take away my children. I have three mm -hmm. because I wasn't good enough because I was working. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I mean, I have tons of experience. <coughs> and we could continue. I don't think this is. Thank the, you very much yeah. for opening up. What was it like for you, Natasha? First of all, um, I just would like to thank AmCham for bringing us here today. I think this is a terrific opportunity, I mean, to focus a little bit about on, you know, women in the business world um, and particularly how the coronavirus, you know, has affected, you know, women in particular. So big thanks to AmCham for bringing us together. Um, so I am a professional diplomat and uh, I will tell you that um, when I speak to women who are interested in becoming um, diplomats, I mean, whether Slovak, whether American, or, you know, some other nationality, the first question they always ask me 
is, is it possible to both be a diplomat and have a family? How do you possibly manage this? Mm -hmm. And um, my answer is that it is possible, but it is significantly more difficult. Um, you know, in diplomacy, we change jobs every few years. And the reality is that men generally, still today, do not follow women. It is usually the other way around. So it is more complicated. And uh, I think this issue of, you know, being a professional woman and also, you know, wanting to have a family, I mean, is, is not just unique to diplomacy. Uh, you know, this issue extends to, you know, many other professions. Thank you very much. Miriam, what about you? Thank you very much. I, I was uh, involved in a civil society sector practically since my secondary school. I mean, I did lots of uh, uh, activities uh, in, uh, in the civil society, and I got used to the fact of being uh, cir circulated by men or then, that time young men. And I think, I mean, I, of course, Throughout my career, I felt situations when whenever I said something, it was absolutely ignored because all the people in the dark suits around me in the, in the room ignored it. Oh, someone picked it up as, as his own idea and it was then continued being somebody else's idea, whatever I said. But on the other hand, I have to admit that I think the situation is changing. And I believe that uh, now women more and more so are respected and then the, the society does understand that maybe certain features of women are bringing uh, added value to the political discussions or, or discussions also in the business. I know that, for example, some of the high-tech businesses are deliberately employing women because they know that they approach to certain tasks differently and that enriches uh, the business approach to certain, certain challenges. So, Yes, the situation is probably not easy, but luckily it's changing. Thank you very much for your input. And we are coming back to the recent situation that we are undergoing right now. Because according to the World Trade Organization, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum and the McKinsey Global Institute, and many other sources, the long-term impact of COVID-19 will be not the same for men and women. And we are currently experiencing the biggest setback in gender equality in a decade. And on top of that, the World Bank also reported that more female businesses were closing down during these last six months. So why is the crisis hitting harsher on women than men? Uh, I think it's understandable uh, because the previous uh, economic crisis uh, hit mostly the sectors where men are or were much more present, and those were manufacturing and uh, construction. This crisis is very different, as uh, it really changed the way of we live, and it limited the travel and uh, social contact, and it hit mostly the sector of services, uh, together with retail, hospitality, uh, tourism, uh, and in these sectors women are much more present. And of course, uh, women were much more unprepared for such a crisis because of long-term existing gender inequalities. Mm. I mean, we know from data that women earn less, save less, hold less secure jobs. Uh, they're more likely to be employed in the informal sector. Uh, they have much less access to social protection, of course, and the majority, they, are, they are the majority of single uh, parents. Households. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, and this is a very weak uh, group of people, mm -hmm. of course. Natasha. Yes, just to add to that, I think there's another key factor here, which is the reality is that women are the primary caretakers of children mm -hmm. and the primary caretakers of you know elderly relatives. Um, women also perform you know most of the unpaid domestic you know labor at home. So uh, there's no question that women are being hit very hard by the coronavirus pandemic. I mean, if you know children cannot go to school, if daycares are closed and somebody has to stay home with the children, 
it is more likely to be, you know, the woman. Um, and that is especially true because, you know, women still in most professions earn less than men. So if a family is making a decision, you know, based on economics about, you know, who should go to work and, uh, you know, who should take a back seat to be home with the, ch the child, mm -hmm. it is usually going to be the woman that does that. Mm -hmm. Miriam, would you like to add anything or can we move on to next question? I would maybe uh, speak a little bit about the household share, uh, the time on, on household, because we know that the statistics show, I mean, it varies in, in different countries. I mean, but in general, in larger Europe, the research shows that uh, uh, when it's in general about four to five hours a day spent on household, uh, women in some countries uh, practically do 70% of the time, and in some other countries it's uh, it's uh, close to to half. But it's always it's always uh, more than a half of or or at least a half of the work. Uh, we have to also uh, take into account what what's already mentioned as well that during the pandemics the children were at home. And there was, I mean, practically the family had to provide education, uh, had to provide food, had to provide uh, out of school activities inside of the house because the children really needed to be amused and, and also mentally relaxed. And this was mainly the task of, the, of women while they were supposed to work online. And I think this work-life balance, especially while working online is something which which is a challenge of, of the future because we know that uh, we are now facing the second wave of the pandemics. But also I think that, uh, I mean, the digital world is pushing us and providing us this opportunity to work from home, which is uh, welcome. But on the other hand, we have to also look into the nuances of this new kind of employment because obviously it has his uh, pitfalls which need to be also taken into account. I think we are all agreeing on that. Mm -hmm. And we will take a question from Slido. Okay, so what is there on the list? Mrs. Nicholson, you got stuck in Brussels for a couple of weeks without your family. How did you cope with the challenging situation? Well, I got stuck in Brussels with two of my children. The third one, who is an adult now, stayed uh, in Bratislava, which wasn't easy, of course, because never for such a long time we've been separated like that. And uh, uh, we survived because uh, uh, even though it wasn't easy, I was supposed to, you know, lead many conferences um, via internet, but you can only do it if you have uh, some place to hide. And this wasn't that easy in <laughs> our find household. find a quiet place to work from, right? The smallest one is four years old mm -hmm. and uh, he needs attention, of course. And the, the child care, the, the kindergarten was closed, the, the school was closed. So it wasn't easy, but I have to say that uh, a big help uh, I received from my husband, who is very understandable. He's got home office, so we sort of shared responsibilities and duties in the household, and only through his huge help uh, um, we made it possible. And it actually got us closer because never ever I experienced days like I didn't have to hurry anywhere because there was nothing, you know, it was just, everything was at home. So I spent lovely moments with my children. That's great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna have one more question from Slido. Uh, Natasha, this could be for you. Do you think that public and private sector companies will transform their internal processes, enabling women to remain at home and work from home? So I actually think um, this is an area of opportunity. I mean, I will say, um, so for, for my employer, for uh, the US Department of State, our foreign ministry, um, telework has not been something that has been widely available uh, you know, to our, our diplomatic staff for a variety of reasons. And suddenly with COVID, we found ourselves in a situation where people could not come into the office, where people had to work from home. Um, so we really had to test, you know, our remote technology. Um, we had to improve our remote technology. Uh, 
And we had to consider how we could think about um, you know, being more flexible for our employees. So in fact, there is now um, an initiative to sort of reimagine how we do our work. Um, and uh, our colleagues in Washington are looking at several different streams of, you know, of activities um, to make remote work more accessible in the future going forward and to give um, employees more flexibility. So I would say that's a real positive that has come out of all of this. Yeah, and we need to find ways how to adopt it to a level where it is beneficial for everyone, but also employees need to be in social interaction with their colleagues. So mm -hmm. yeah, to find a balance between the social interaction and, and the flexible working arrangements. Before the crisis, the World Economic Forum predicted it would take another 257 years to reach economic parity between women and men. And it is very frustrating that the figures has to be set back by a decade. Uh, how do you think can we help women in the countries which were hit the most and in the economies which are suffering tremendously due to the COVID-19 crisis? Maybe you again, Natasha, because you spend a lot of time abroad. Sure. Um, well, look, th there's no question uh, that in the, you know, in many countries in the developing world, um, you know, the pandemic uh, has had a particularly detrimental effect on, you know, women's progress. Uh, I think I saw the statistic, for example, that I think 10% of the world's population lives in Latin America, but um, a quarter of the deaths worldwide from COVID have been in Latin America. Um, and, you know, many of those countries have, uh, weaker public health systems where there are a lot of challenges. Um, I would say that one thing I think all of us can do, I mean, to, uh, you know, to support women around the world in countries um, that are really facing acute crises is to consider um, looking at ways to, you know, to, to donate and to support um, international organizations, non-governmental organizations that are working around the world in some of the communities that are hardest hit Mm -hmm. to provide, uh, you know, uh, increased social uh, safety nets, you know, for women. Thank you. What is your perspective on that, uh, Miriam? I think that there are a couple of things we need to do, and obviously they are different in the Western part of the world and in, in, the, in the third countries. I would say in, uh, in, in our countries, what I believe is absolutely es essential is to provide uh, adequate uh, social coverage to women who are either uh, at home at a maternity leave or are working only partly because they are bringing up children. We know that the demographic crisis is practically bringing a big social challenge and we know that uh, families with children are the only a sustainable moment in the whole social system. And that's why I believe that women should be adequately awarded for also the time when they are spending with their children, because this, is, this supports the sustainability of the whole social system. So for example, we know that, uh, that the maternity leave, uh, the, the, the time when a woman, woman was, uh, is on a maternity leave, the, the calculation of this time to her pension scheme uh, creates a very low pensions. And I believe that this is something which needs to be improved. Uh, in the third world country, I, I would maybe uh, mention, of course, there are lots of uh, issues which can be addressed, but I will mention one issue. I think what is absolutely essential is that the that, uh, Western companies employing women in the garment sector and other, other sector, it's important that they are provided proper jobs with certain security of these jobs because that's actually the crucial issue which make the women in the third countries absolutely vulnerable to any economic shocks is that their jobs are not sustainable and their jobs are don't have any i mean pra practically it, usually they don't have any any legal way how to how to fight for their rights so i think this is very important that we should be our western companies should be the leaders in providing more secure jobs to women in the third countries. Thank you very much for your input. Lucia? Yes, first of all, I think that we 
it's our duty to finally uh, start using the EU funds uh, properly and effectively. And in this situation, we should uh, really focus uh, on the most uh, vulnerable groups of, of people, uh, women, of course, including. Uh, the whole world was, was hit by COVID-19. Of course, we have many EU member states who were hit really hard, such as Spain and Italy and so on. But there is a huge financial help from coming from the EU funds. Actually, Slovakia will have so much money that we never ever experienced this amount of money. We just have to use it. And up until now, we were not able to use the uh, European funds uh, properly or to use them at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a great Can opportunity. Can you also tell us why? Um, many, there are many, many, many factors, or? many factors. I mean, we made it uh, so um, difficult for the recipients to, to get the money through bureaucracy mm -hmm. that basically many people just gave up and many companies just gave up and this has to change. Uh, the, the access to the money should be as flexible as, as possible. And uh, the other thing is that, of course, organized crime was really focused in this country on the EU funding funds and the money coming from it, as mm -hmm. it was a huge amount. There was a big uh, amount of corruption, and we just didn't handle it properly. So, so there, are, there are many things, but we can't fight the corruption by using... Uh, when it comes to EU funds, uh, by making it impossible for decent companies, decent people, decent representatives to actually get access to the, mm -hmm. the funds. This, is, this, is, this would be the worst uh, case scenario if we did this with the coming money from the next generation fund. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, according to the international monetary funds, um, uh, the situation is particularly harsh now for low-income developing countries, as, as mentioned, and we can help them uh, either financially, of course, donations and so on, this is, this is our duty, but we also have to help them uh, to, for instance, fight the gender role stereotypes, because this is, this is the thing that makes it really impossible for women in these countries to, to start working uh, the work-family balance, uh, there has to be a decent uh, care system for the children uh, when we want uh, the woman to participate on the labor market. Uh, because there is a huge lack of affordable care. This is something mm -hmm. that also applies for Slovakia. I mean, we, know, we all know this story that we just don't have uh, enough capacities and uh, but but the affordable care is not only for the children but also for elderly because mm -hmm. what our women face uh, usually is not only that they have to take care of the household and the children but, the but also people as well. yeah mm -hmm. and the social services uh, mm -hmm. are um, not working uh, very well in Slovakia i mean the mm -hmm. financing is very poor and uh, this this should be a priority for our government too mm -hmm. Mrs. Franceschi, you spent a lot of time abroad. You were, um, prior to your assignment in Bratislava, you were in Washington and as director of the State Department's Office of Caucasus Affairs and Regional Conflicts. Mm -hmm. You also served as deputy director of the Office of Arabian Peninsula Affairs, deputy political counselor at Embassy Baghdad, and the list goes on. And you also spent some time in Islamabad, uh, Astana, Sarajevo, and Moscow. And I think that we will agree that these are the countries where gender equality is in its infancy. So what should the local governments or global governments do to support women in these vulnerable groups? So I think um, most of our countries, including you know, my own, still have progress that can be made on and should be made on, you know, on women's issues and making you know, women full participants. Um, you know, in the workforce. Um, a really key issue I'd say in the United States right now, uh, just to speak a little bit about, you know, my home country, uh, is the issue of how to bring children back to school safely. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a really key issue in terms of being able to return, you know, women fully to the workplace. 
Um, I actually think Slovakia is quite lucky that you've got children who are back physically in school. But in many communities of the United States right now, um, children have started the school year online. Mm -hmm. uh, and this presents, you know, very significant challenges for parents who both um, are supposed to be working and, uh, you know, are now sort of the, uh, the teachers of the online school. Uh, but it also underscores um, economic inequality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are finding that in many communities, you know, children do not have laptop, laptop computers to be able to get online. They don't have wireless access. You know, they do, in many cases, do not have a, you know, a parent who is there at home to help them. Um, in some communities, they don't have, you know, parents that speak, that speak English. And also for us in the United States, um, schools actually provide an important source of nutrition in, in un underserved communities in terms of providing school lunches. And so without schools being in session, these um, economic inequalities are really being exposed. So I think uh, one really key issue in terms of uh, looking at, you know, recovery from the coronavirus is finding ways. And I mean, it's a very, very challenging issue um, that many experts have different opinions on how to do best. But, uh, you know, finding ways to return children safely to school, mm -hmm. you know, so that parents can return to the workforce. Yeah. Miriam, what is your perspective on that? You mean the first question or the second question? <laughs> any question you pick. It's your, it's your time to, to react to any question. But maybe, maybe, regarding, maybe regarding the most hated countries and, and the communities and societies there. I think what, what is important, of course, I mean, we need to provide immediate help. But we also have a plan how to help to change the situation. And I used to work in an in a NGO supporting democracy worldwide, the International Republican Institute before, and we had many programs in, in many countries where we are trying to bring women into public offices, uh, into politics, because I think that we, we cannot support these women only from outside. We need to foster changes in the countries where women, if women will be part of the decision making, obviously, they, as a result, there should be a proper legislation, there should be more secure jobs for women, and that will help women to be less vulnerable to, to, to the economic shocks. So I, I really think that we should have a short term strategy, as uh, Ms. Juris Nikolsonova was mentioning, to support the current needs of those women in the third countries, but we should definitely elaborate more our long term strategies how to change a societal approach to the to gender and, and to the role of women in order to support the stronger position of women in the decision making uh, of the country. Thank you very much. You wanted to react as well. Yes, I wanted to react to Madame Franceschi. Uh, what she said about the education and uh, the access of children to online education. Now, when we are talking about the third world countries, we also have to mention our socially excluded communities, which are the Roma communities mm. in Slovakia, because mm -hmm. there the people live in conditions mm -hmm. over third world uh, countries. And uh, uh, the truth is that uh, this COVID-19, this whole pandemic just showed us uh, how unprepared are their households, mm -hmm. for instance, for uh, online education. They didn't have any access to online education. And this is very sad. Mm -hmm. When, you know, we are a country, a member of European Union and so on, and uh, really this is, this is a big challenge for the future. For the second wave, you know, if it comes and the, the schools but how would can have we to address be closed. These issues? Well, Who can provide them with the technological we, we need more people there. We need social workers. We need uh, teachers who might be able to work with the kids there in smaller groups, in community centers. But first of all, I mean, we have to admit we don't have community centers in all the Roma settlements. And there are now uh, almost no conditions how to how to educate uh, the kids, maybe just to go from household to household. And I think it would be very naive that now we can connect uh, all of the households to internet. So we have to find um, 
an effective way mm -hmm. how uh, they will still get some access to education. And I would uh, suggest to, uh, to work with the social workers uh, to launch the project for social workers for teachers who might be able to work with these, uh, these kids. This, this could be effective. But we have to react uh, very fast. Yeah, yeah. That's. Hi, yeah, maybe we have a question here. We have, yeah, uh, Miriam, please. <laughs> yes, I just, I, would just, I just wanted to add one thing, is that during the pandemic, the first wave when everything was locked down, uh, the NGO sector was trying to provide lots of help to the needs which were created by the pandemics, which was like, as, as uh, Ms. Durish Nicholson and I mentioned, uh, families who, who were supposed to homeschool children, but they had no connection to internet or they had no laptops, or uh, the mental health of, of people. I mean, we know that there was much higher uh, societal tendencies among teenagers as well as adults which needed to be treated. I mean, there are lots of new phenomena in the society which had to be addressed and was usually the non-governmental sector addressing this because that was far more flexible. So when we talk about the recovery pack of the, of the EU, I think this is also part where needs to be, where we need to invest the money because obviously these shocks and the kind of waves of needs might come also in the future and we have to be ready for it to provide the help. And I, was, I, I would like to also mention one thing is that of course we have to, mention, uh, we have to spend this money in such a way that it brings, uh, brings uh, it will pay, it, the, the investment will pay uh, itself. But on the other hand, I think for example, uh, increasing salaries of teachers, which are mainly women, is an investment which is worth because we will have a better quality teachers and better quality teaching and the, and the whole education system will, the, the quality of whole education system will increase. And we know that women are the majority of, um, of, the, of the workers in the education sector. So I believe that we also need to think strategically about the different sectors, how to spend these EU funds and this opportunity we have got through the EU funds strategically. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's going to be very hard to implement these measures and it's a you know, long-term strategy rather than tactics. We have a question coming from the audience, please. Um, Adam uh, Nikolsonova, uh, you are speaking about a really important topic and I would say it requires a structural change within the society. Uh, but when I take a look at the audience and we have mostly women here talking to women, uh, and if I take a look at the you know, number of panelists, uh, men are really in minority. Uh, do you see uh, within the European uh, politics, men as leaders for a positive change which needs to be done, and also here in Slovakia? Because I think it's not about women talking to women, uh, men should be included. So do we have kind of positive deviation here in Slovakia, because you know also Slovak politics as well as Brussels politics, uh, as well as in Brussels, uh, these male leaders, so-called, which are required in order to achieve positive changes within the society. Of course, we have already um, president of the ECB, a female one, uh, president of the European Commission, for the first time, you know, both female, very ambitious, very capable, uh, which is absolutely fantastic, but this is not enough. So, where are the men? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, first of all, I think that we can uh, achieve nothing without men. Uh, I really think that we have to do this together and uh, without men the change is impossible. And I can see it on the level of European Parliament, European Commission, European Union as such, that uh, the discussion um, is between men and women as equal partners. This is, this is very important. I'm not as optimistic uh, when it comes to the national level. I think still, uh, it's what I, what I said uh, at the beginning, that uh, when a woman gets enthusiastic, and there are topics that we can get enthusiastic about, 
uh, we are considered to be hy hysterical. And there is always, you know, the big man who is the big leader, who is better than the us, who can do better than us. But also as a society, we are much more critical towards women and women are critical to women. Sometimes our biggest uh, uh, critiques are not men, but women. Tell us uh, women. And, you Sometimes. know, I never experienced uh, when it comes to a man leader, when he goes to work after his baby was born, I've never experienced any discussion about that. Nobody asked him, why did you do that? Why did you go to work when you have a small baby at home? But these questions always appear when a public, publicly known woman goes to work and everybody knows that she has a, has a small child, you know? So I don't think this is, this is fair because, I mean, behind every successful woman, there is a man who helps to achieve the success. This is, this is my experience. This is, yeah. this is, you know, without my husband, I wouldn't be able to do what I do and what I love. And um, really, I think there is a lot to be done. Uh, we have many obstacles in our mentality as a, as a uh, society, the Slovak society. But uh, I think it's my duty for instance, to fight against the stereotypes that are so deeply in our mentality, still. I would like to hand over to Miriam because you have also some observations from the European Parliament. So what is your take on that? I, as I said at the very beginning, is that the, I think the society is luckily changing in the Western world. And it's, it, it is as it was in the question, like, where are the men? I think they are men who realize that if they will bring more women on board, we'll be more efficient in, in answering to the different challenges that, that are coming in our societies or, or globally. And I believe that this is really the strategy. If we will, in the partnership, we'll find a space where there will be more um, dialogue going on about the different approaches and where women will be brought on board. I think this is this is practically the solution, and and I think it is happening. I mean, we have to push for it. We have to be probably quite clear that this should be one of the goals we reach. But I think now, as as it was said, I mean, with women leaders on the key positions of the European Union, I think this trend is already there, and we have to just we have to make sure that it will not turn the other way around, that man's position will be weakened, because I believe that this is something where we should really show the equality and joint approach to, to, to stand up to the, to the challenges. Thank you very much. To spice up the conversation, we are going to take uh, another question from Slido. And thank you very much for contributing to our discussion. We really appreciate it. According to the, to the UN, the domestic violence increased by 25%, which puts women in a very vulnerable situation. What is your perspective on that? Are there any social protection initiatives at place? Natasha. Sure. Um, I think the domestic, the increase in domestic violence is being experienced um, in countries around the world that are affected by COVID-19. Um, I saw a statistic from the uh, Slovak Prosecutor General that during the height of the COVID crisis, the number of uh, you know reported domestic violence incidents of domestic violence had increased by almost 50 percent over the same period last year. I mean, this is a big issue in you know the United States um, as well. I've seen uh, that President Chaputova has been very outspoken on this issue. Um, and a big, you know, advocate, um, uh, you know, to draw attention to, uh, you know, to this specific problem. And I think, you know, I, I think that's really important. Um, I will say, uh, in terms of the United States overall response, we have given um, over $11 billion to worldwide COVID response efforts. And a portion of that has been specifically directed um, towards, uh, to look at, you know, gender issues. Um, as part of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and just uh, in terms of what our embassy here in Bratislava has done, 
uh, you know, we annually do a July 4th party to celebrate our Independence Day. And this year, uh, we decided not to do that um, and to do a charity campaign instead. And the organization uh, for that women. We, uh, we decided to support a mm -hmm. domestic violence um, shelter here uh, in, in Nitra, um, recognizing the significantly increased, you know, needs uh, to support, you know, women in situations of domestic violence. Very generous of you. Lucia, you have some interesting statistics. When yes, it comes uh, to domestic I mean, violence. all of the statistics show that uh, it's been very bad when it comes to domestic uh, violence, and we knew it because when the lockdown came and we knew that the victims were all of a sudden closed in one room, in one flat, uh, with um, the the men or Abuser. abusers and partners and so on. So uh, we should have seen it was coming. And in some countries, I think the reactions were much faster than in some other countries. Uh, I wrote immediately a letter to our Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs so that we take the measures to, to fight the domestic violence uh, during the pandemic. I mean, those were very easy and concrete steps. Can you be more specific? Yes, I suggested that, for instance, we would use the hotels that were empty because of the lockdown as shelters for, for women. Because, I mean, in general, uh, this pandemic, when it comes to the domestic violence, showed us how small amount of money we invest in taking measures, whether there is a pandemic or not. So mm -hmm. it really found us unprepared. And I have to say that the reaction of our government was quite quite uh, slow, and uh, I think we should we Do should you know really. know the reasons why, or I think what they was had the other they the had letter? other priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to me, the the vulnerable people, and in this case, uh, the victims of domestic uh, violence, uh, is a group of people who deserve uh, our attention. And we should consider it a priority even now, because now we have to learn uh, from the situation and we should definitely, there are funds coming from European Union uh, that we can use to support measures like training of police people, you know, training of psychologists and so on, so that we can actually get ready for another situation like that. Mm -hmm. Miriam. Many governments have adopted a broad range of support measures to help individuals and societies and businesses. Some of these measures were mainly social protection initiatives adopted by some central and local governments, and they were specifically targeted at women. Have you adopted any specific policies in the European Union and the European Parliament that will financially support women? Well, the European Parliament has, uh, has come up with a, with a range of policies which we, we, which we passed during the pandemics. And then, of course, the implementation is on the member states. Uh, they were uh, policies which were indirectly focused on women, because obviously, I mean, we are trying to support all the socially vulnerable sectors, and women are in many of those. But also, they were, there was a particularly women as a socially and particularly vulnerable groups. They were mentioned in many, many uh, laws the European Parliament has passed in order to help the government to help these women directly. So I, I don't, I mean, of course, these measures had to be taken by the, by the member states. So it, it was not something which we, we would dictate the member states. Practically, we made flexible the funding of the unspent European funds for the, for, for the member states, and the member states could use it in order to efficiently address the needs. And of course, we were in practically in every legislation piece, we are asking that women and children and the socially vulnerable groups, as well as elderly people, including people with disabilities, including people who are carers for people with disabilities, mothers, and, uh, and big families, they were among those who were always listed as the target of, of, the, of the financial schemes where the government should have come up, come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Lucia? I would say that uh, at the beginning, the European uh, Commission didn't react uh, fast enough to the pandemic. I mean, we all uh, expect it from the European Commission or European institutions as such that they would co coordinate um, the measures taken by uh, certain mem member states. And this didn't happen, but uh, what happened was that uh, really we launched um, a huge uh, financial support to the member states to combat uh, the consequences of the pandemic. And in these uh, targets, in these funds, they were not specifically targeted on women, but of course, uh, the help also went to, to, to women. We had the mechanism of SURE. Which Could you the, count it somehow? Or oh, those were, those, were, those were billions of, uh, of, mm -hmm. uh, of euros that, of course, it was up to the member states how they are going to use it, how effectively they are going to, to use it. For instance, we came up with SURE, which is the EU funding for short-time work schemes with a budget of 100 billion euros. So mm -hmm. this should really help the workers who had to stay at home mm -hmm. uh, to get some income. Uh, then we had the Corona Response Investment Initiative, uh, which enabled member states to flexibly use uh, money of cohesion funds uh, to help uh, those ones who were who suffered from the crisis, and these were healthcare workers, hospitals, most of them uh, are women, of course, uh, then to help the small and medium enterprises and to the workers as such. Then we had European uh, Fund for European Aid to the Most Deprived. Mm -hmm. And this is something um, uh, I think very interesting when we are talking about uh, women as a vulnerable group mm -hmm. of people who was... Um, who had to deal with the uh, consequences. This uh, is a fund that provides food uh, and basic material assistance to the most deprived, and many of uh, this help went through uh, to the single parents, and most of them are, the majority of them are women. So they also got help uh, through this fund. So you have mechanisms yes. that can track whether the help was really distributed to those people in need? Definitely we do, and uh, we collect the data and we evaluate uh, the, the, the use of the money, whether it was effective or not, and whether all the groups, uh, vulnerable groups, uh, received what they are supposed to receive from this fund. But it mm -hmm. is up to the member states to say which of the groups are the most vulnerable ones uh, who should get uh, the help from this fund. Thank you very much. We looked at some of the most vulnerable groups uh, across the globe and women in third world countries and developing countries were hit really hard. But the situation is a little bit different from women in the European Union and in Slovakia. So what are the biggest challenges that we are facing here in European Union and, and in Slovakia, because clearly not all of the women and female workers had to close down their businesses or lost their enterprises. Natasha? Well, I would say, I mean, the domestic violence issue is a really serious issue. As I, as I mentioned, um, the statistics I've heard about how this is affecting, um, this is affecting families throughout Slovakia um, are really significant, but that's not ju you know it's not just confined to Slovakia. I mean, it, it's it's a problem in all the countries that have been have been hit by that. So I would I would highlight that as one one aspect. From your perspective, how do you perceive it? Well, not just the domestic uh, violence, but also other challenges. Yes, I mean, especially for Slovakia, I think that every woman who wants to go to work, who wants to work, should work, whether she has uh, children or not, and and. Now in these days it is not really possible because of the lack uh, of the preschool f facilities. Uh, so I would start really with this uh, uh, to, to make access to all of the young families with children to uh, preschool facilities. Even the Council r recommendations on Slovakia's national reform program repeatedly point uh, out the persistent gap uh, in employment and pay between men and women. Uh, in Slovakia, this is another problem that we have to fight because it's uh, above 
above the average in mm -hmm. European Union. So I would say these are the two uh, things. And also, uh, uh, when we are talking about the low employment rate of women, uh, especially in Slovakia, it is also caused by long parental leave. I mean, this is according to the data, and they really show us that after two kids, uh, it is uh, not easy. Six years when you six add it up years, together. Six years, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, there's, it, it is a huge gap. The labor market is um, really very progressive, very, very yeah. progressive, and six years out of the labor market, is, it really makes it uh, very difficult for women to get back to labor market and succeed. Mm -hmm. So this is another issue, whether there is pandemic or not, that uh, we have to seriously discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will take another question from our Slido. Miriam, a question for you. Is Commission preparing some policies, advices for local governments within EU related to the rules, benefits for parents, which will need to stay at home because of COVID? This is mainly the legislation which should be addressed by the member states uh, due to the division of the task or, or the competencies of the European Union. Obviously, the European Commission is monitoring the, the situation in the member states and it's trying to address the, the, the needs which are actual in the different countries and in the European Union as such. And in terms of, uh, of I mean, to respond to the issue of, um, of the situation of women, I would maybe bring up a couple of issues. I mean, we in the, in the social committee of the European Parliament, we are looking into the into the fact which I already mentioned, which is, first of all, the, the gap, uh, practically our families, uh, especially after having a third child, are facing poverty. In many, in many, many member states, of course, the, the amount of children where the family starts to face poverty varies in the different countries. But this is something the European Union is trying to look into because of the demographic challenge. So practically, this issue is being addressed also vis-a-vis -vis the demographic challenge we are facing as the European Union. We know that we need to provide broader support to families, which normally means in practice that the maternity leave, and when we bring it to Slovakia, is so low that that pushes women that they, they're trying to uh, go to the labor market as soon as possible, but taking jobs which are very low paid because they need also the flexibility to still stay or support their rather small children. So in order to give a more space for a woman for a choice when she wants to go to work and, and what kind of job she wants to ch ch uh, take, that uh, the, if, if we increase the maternity or the support to families uh, with children and the support for children, I would say, that will help. Also, as I already mentioned earlier, the pension scheme needs to be restructured in order to uh, address or uh, re reflect, I would say, in order to reflect the, 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 the value family has for the whole social sector. But I would say one more, uh, another issue which is now being picked up, picked up by the EU, but it also needs to be picked up by the member state, and is the change of the labor market. I mean, we know that the artificial intelligence and digitalization is enormously changing the labor market. And we know that women are less involved in, edu I mean, less interested in the education in IT sector, and also there are less women working in the IT sector. And this is something which needs to be supported that women will study IT and will take jobs in the IT sector because this is the future. And if we are not helping women to, to get ready for this change, women will be against losing because of the change, where actually this change can help them because these. Uh, new technologies can help with the household can help those women who are caring of uh, for the of the elderly people so there the, there will be help provided by the new technologies but if women will be not able to uh, embrace this help it will make them even more vulnerable on the on the labor market that's very interesting thank you very much would you like to elaborate on that yes thank you very much uh I absolutely agree with Miriam because all of the data show us that uh, it will be women who will be really much more affected on the labor market uh, with uh, 
you know, coming artificial intelligence and, and uh, other IT things. And uh, we really need for uh, our women, especially in Slovakia, because we are not ready for the automation at all. The mm. whole labor market is not ready uh, compared to other countries such as Finland, for in instance. And uh, we really need effective lifelong learning for our women to prevent uh, the loss of job. We have to start working in the, uh, with them um, in educating them uh, with uh, soft skills. And, uh, but the very interesting thing is that when we are talking about teleworking and online work and so on, which might make it easier for, for the Slovak woman, uh, a big topic, a big issue that we are dealing uh, with now in European Union is the right to disconnect. Mm -hmm. Because this is uh, really something that is becoming a problem that uh, if you work, you know, using uh, some laptops and cell online, phones, yes, emails. I mean, when is the time for you to disconnect? Then you are always connected and basically always working. And this is becoming a serious issue that we are discussing uh, right now at our committee in the European Parliament. And we are trying to find a good solution for everybody, for the employees and for the employers. We are not disconnecting right now. We are connecting to you guys and feel free to contribute to our discussion. And I think that we have one question from the audience. Please, Ronald. Thank you for letting me ask another question. Uh, You're this very is active. You will, give, uh, you will get the gift voucher. <laughs> okay, that's my <laughs> ultimate intention. Uh, this is a question I would like to ask basically all the speakers. The reputation of V4 countries is not really that great in Brussels currently. And we are considered to be, you know, kind of troublemakers, maybe not Slovakia, but in general the region, and also to be considered like a kind of quite conservative region. Nevertheless, Slovakia, as the first country in the region, has already got a female prime minister as well as a female president. Are we different or we are not that different from our neighbors? Thank you. Mm. That's a gr great question. Thank you very much. Would you like to react? I hope we are different. I mean, you can see it with our president. Really, so far, Slovakia was well known because we had Sagan. I mean, right now there is a Tour of France, you know, I'm watching it. And I've been always so proud that none of our politicians made such a great promotion for our country. As and the hockey players. As Sagan, but don't okay, forget but about the hockey players. They are old now, you know, but Sagan, <laughs> Sagan can still uh, win. Yeah, we are and still living from the fame from yes, 2000, but, right? <laughs> but right now, it's not only Sagan that Slovakia is very well known all over the world, all over the European Union, but it's our Madame Chaputova, the president. And this is, I'm all, it always makes me so proud when people, you know, stop by. Uh, in European Parliament, they say, oh, you're, you're from Slovakia, you have the greatest president ever, and they are very jealous about our, our president. So I think this is a great news to our society. This is a great message that we send uh, to the world, that we are different, because, you know, I'm watching very closely the situation in Poland with the abortion law and the, uh, you know, the sexual education teachers ended up in, in jail and so on. I actually am in one political group with representatives from PiS, from the Polish government, which makes it really not easy for me because I'm a liberal and, um, yeah, uh, together with Hungary, the V4 is not the, ba the, the best um, company. company for us anymore, mm. I would say so. We're in not a very diplomatic way, but I'm, I'm honest in this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of our president, Mrs. Chaputova. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our discussion, but I would like to pose one more question, because it is estimated that around one 195 millions of people will lose their jobs due to the pandemic, out of which the majority are women. 
and some of the jobs will be gone forever, or at least we need to reassess and transform some of the jobs. And simultaneously, women represent the biggest opportunity for economic growth in a full potential scenario in which women play an identical role in labor market to men, we can add as much as 28 trillion American dollars to the global GDP. So how are we going to create new opportunities for women when we are in a situation like this? Natasha. Yes, I mean, I would say, first of all, look, the benefits of having diverse and inclusive teams are very, very well known. So I think we have to keep, you know, pushing and encouraging, I mean, all of our employers, uh, you know, to, to really look at embracing diversity and inclusion. Um, second of all, I think, um, you know, mentor networks and, you know, supporting women, and that doesn't have to just be women supporting women, that's also, I mean, as my colleague here said, I mean, it's men supporting, you know, women, also is really important. Um, so we have to empower, uh, we have to empower younger women, we have to give them skills, um, and uh, we have to help inspire them so that they can become full participating members. Thank you very much. Miriam, handing over to you. I would completely agree that, I mean, it obviously varies in, uh, in uh, the third world country and in, in, in the more developed or Western countries, what support women need. I think in our geopolitical uh, space, we need to provide or, or support women in getting education in the trendy sectors, which I already mentioned before, and also uh, encourage companies to employ women in high positions because this can bring profit to the to the companies as well as the as the governmental sector as well. And luckily, we already do have women in the in the political leadership in the third world country. I think this is. Practically, our effort should be to, to support uh, security, more secure jobs, and really pay jobs for the women, and as well as uh, support women to uh, run for political positions, because I think this is one of the only ways how we can change the societal approach to, to the gap between men and women. Thank you. Final words from you. Yeah, I, I have a list of specific measures that we should take. First of all, promote work-life balance through flexible uh, work arrangements. This is necessary. We have to ensure access to affordable care when it comes not only to children, but also to elderly pe people. We have to eliminate discrimination because there is still discrimination at the labor market. We have to achieve equal pay mm -hmm. for equal jobs. This is very essential. We have to tackle occupational segregation because it is women now who in occupations regarded as unskilled or low valued, so this has to change and create quality care jobs mm -hmm. also for women who, who work in this sector, but they are very poorly paid. So I think with this, we should be doing fine. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much once again for joining in, ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for being online. Thank it you. was a very fruitful and inspiring conversation. And hopefully we will achieve the goals that will empower and support women during this phase. Thank you once again. Thank a big you. applause for ladies. This was our first panel discussion and I hope that you enjoyed it. And we learned that we found ourselves in a very difficult situation and especially women who had to care for their families and take on some childcare responsibilities. They lost more jobs globally because they are working in sectors which were very sensitive to the crisis such as tourism and retail and other, also other sorts of sectors. So in order to improve the situation, we have to make the uh, access to money easier and we also need to find a work-life balance for working mothers. We need to eliminate discrimination and it is also very important to get children back to school to enable women to get back to their work and their job positions. So I am very glad that we had this conversation but we, had to, we have to move on and the next 
panelists, I mean, sorry, no, not, not panelists, but the next guest will be Katarina Hutirova, the founder and owner of the second-hand store Nosene, who will talk about the sustainable and slow fashion. And on top of that, she will give us some useful tricks how to build a sustainable wardrobe for life and what is also the capsule wardrobe, which is very popular recently. So I am handing over to Katarina. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. So, uh, what was my first question this morning, and maybe yours too? It's, what should I wear? We think about fashion subconsciously, and sorry, I just need this. Subconsciously, and uh, what should I wear is one of the fundamental questions. It's important what we wear. Really? Really. Because first is why I'm here and why I'm talking about sustainability in fashion and about this business. When I was younger and I started making money, I was a shopaholic. I didn't care. I didn't care about fashion. I didn't care who made my clothes. I didn't care about things. So I just want to be cool. Uh, look nice and uh, all the money I, ma I made I spent on fashion on clothes because I wanted more and more and uh, be cool and my wardrobe looked like this I had maybe 50 pairs of shoes and so many unworked pieces of clothes and uh, when came change uh, it started when I moved uh, my own and uh, I start thinking about sustainability in fashion and about fashion as, uh, as one. And uh, it was in 20, 2013 when uh, garment factory collapsed in Bangladesh. And uh, it was in Rana Plaza. And uh, there died 1,300 people. And uh, this was the biggest, uh, biggest, uh, Sorry. This was the biggest uh, fail in, fa uh, in fashion industry. So my first step was when I started Nosane, and I don't buy uh, nothing from uh, fast fashion retails. Uh, after four years, I buy new item items, and uh, it was this uh, pair of uh, pants which I loved. And uh, when I look at uh, in the shop, I tried. I I know I knew at this moment. I wear it so many times. For today, I wear it uh, 40 or 50 times. And uh, I look uh, for this style one and a half uh, years, and uh, I couldn't find them in second hand. So this was, this was uh, why, I, why I buy it. And I have another story with this dress, which you, which you see. Uh, when Zara brought, to new collection two years uh, ago. Uh, I look at it I, and I liked it and I don't buy it because I didn't want to support the fast fashion. I had, um, I had seen many other women in this dress and every time when I saw them, I uh, was thinking about it and uh, I was waiting. And a few months ago, when I uh, was helping my neighbor with cleaning her, her job, uh, I saw this again. And she said to me, I don't wear it, you can take it. Okay, I bought it from her and I, was feel, I felt like in game casino or something like that. Because I bought it from her, I don't uh, support fast fashion, I do something for sustainability because this dress don't uh, end in landfill. So this is example I try to teach her and other people uh, about sustainability and uh, how we can change sustainable, how we can change uh, fashion industry. And this is the dress. It's from second hand after two years ago, a later. And uh, what is fashion? And what is clothes? Clothes are our initial and most basic tool of communication every day. How do I feel today? What is the weather like? What do I want to say? Because it's our communicate outside. Every day, millions of people buy clothes without 
any truth or remorse for the consequences of those purchases. Shopping was becoming Americans' favorite pastime. And why? Our clothes convey our social and economic status, our occupation, our ambition, our self-worth. And when we wear something, we retell what we, what we want, what we, what we think. And shoppers snap up five times more clothing now than did in 1980. And try to guess about this number. It's 80 billions. Okay, nothing special for, for us now. And when you take this, the world produces, the world produces 8 billion apparel items annually. That is crazy. It's only for our, it's only for, for our shopping. And uh, when you take basic cotton t-shirt, every one of us have one on our real job. Probably uh, nobody exists in the world which will have uh, this, uh, this t-shirt. And when you, so <laughs> when you see 2,700 liters of water and uh, imagine uh, this piece requires 2,700 so, uh, 2,700 liters of water to produce only for one t-shirt, which we have on our rare job, that is crazy because it's water for one person for two and a half a year. And cotton, it's one of agriculture's most polluting crops. And why is fashion so, so important and why, it's, uh, why we need to know more about, about this? Because, uh, I mean, my clothes, it, is nothing, and uh, and uh, it was uh, it was uh, nothing human human. Uh, okay, <laughs> it was it was nothing uh, made with uh, human labor, and everything that we wear it's human labor. Fashion employs one of six people on the globe, making in the most labor-intensive industry of there more than agriculture, more than defense. Less than 2% of these people earn a living wage. And the fashion industry is responsible for nearly 20% of all industrial water pollution annually. And it produces 10% of carbon emission on the air. And if you take one kilogram of clothes, generate 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases. And that is crazy. And uh, how we can change it? how we can change this or do something today or do something tomorrow. <laughs> we, can, uh, we can make first step is change our behavior. What do I mean? Every one of us doesn't wear around 40% of their garments. Sustainable business is one, of if, <laughs> is one big business in the world. And we are consumers and we have power. We can they talk to us and decide. I decide every day where I spend my money, who I will support with my money, and what I'm willing to buy. And if I need something new, I ask myself, and you can ask yourself, do you really need it? Does it make you happy? Does everything have to be new? Or can it also buy second hand? So you can choose who support you. And you can buy green ethical products, choose quality about quantity, buy less when it's possible, reuse if you can, and recycle what is left. And what is first step, what you, what you can do today, it's shopping in your closet. Because everything what we need, we have in our wardrobe. And we have more questions about vegan and about uh, how sustainable is our vegan clothes because no animals are used to make them, but aren't alternatives to later often made of plastic, which in turn comes from oil. And how sustainable is our laptop? How sustainable is our daily, daily living when uh, we uh, take how long we was in the shower and other on the question. And this is uh, important. You can buy things, but we can do it differently. More fun, a little less, and with more value for your money. How you mean? How I mean it? Because when you choose quality about quantity, buy less when it's possible, and reuse if you can recycle what is left. And um, 
now is the now we have only last uh, last time only last change uh, last sorry uh, only now we can uh, take our responsibility and uh, about climate change because uh, we we stay stay here and uh, we have here uh, global warming and we if uh, too with uh, with uh, with fashion, because fashion is second dirtiest industry in the world. And we, when we say this, and we can make better impact that only talk about sustainable or zero waste lifestyle, it, it's about what you do, not only what you say. So take your quotes and uh, choose what you, what you really want and, uh, and uh, take care and love your planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katarina. It was very inspiring. And if there's just one thing you should take away from the presentation, then I'd say that the keyword is sustainability because we are finding ourselves in climate change and climate crisis, and we all should be a little minimalists. And now I'm happy to invite you to a little virtual tour <laughs> Hi, can you see me? This is our studio where we are working the magic. This is the green screen behind me and here we have our wonderful audience. Please wave into the camera. Yes, yeah, so we are having a short break in a minute and if you're at home and watching us from home, get refreshed, get some coffee or some little munchies and we're gonna meet again at two o'clock 30 minutes. And yeah, just get refreshed, respond to your emails and bear with us because many, many interesting things are coming up and presentations. Yeah, that's Ronald from the MCHEM <laughs> and our, our contributor to our discussions. So see you in a minute. Bye, guys.